Hey guys, welcome to episode one of the Let's Talk Commander podcast. I'm your host speaking, Adrian, followed by my co-host, Zach. Hi, how are you? <laughs> and we are here to talk about Commander today. Um, yeah. Mainly because this is our first episode of our pilot. We are going to go into uh, how we got into everything, how we got into Magic, and uh, yeah. So, uh, Adrian, how long have you been playing? Um, I would say I've been playing for about eight years now. <laughs> when, when, I, I, when, I, when I tell people how long I've been playing, it's it's hard to go over because I sometimes can't remember the exact year. I just say whenever Shadows of Indistrad came out, something around that time. Yeah, um, what's weird, I think for, for me, Magic... When I was younger, Magic was just one of those things where I'd play for a month and then I'd stop for a year and then I'd get back into it. But now it's just like a constant thing that I'm into, right. which is like, it's kind of fun, honestly. But with all this quarantine thing, I really have no choice but to just, I can't play or anything. <laughs> I just right. look at cards and brew decks online. It's been mostly Magic the Gathering Arena. It was yeah. similar that for that uh, for me because uh, in earlier days when I was only able to play uh, standard because I didn't have the funds to do something like play commander, it was easy for me to just pick it up for a month and then stop playing. But in even getting into commander, it was harder to do that when, until you had you know the funds to the precons uh, too right and the precons for commander to get into it. And uh, eventually I did, and I, and I was able to stick with it longer, so I, I, uh, I, I really got into Magic and Commander, and it's been going pretty strong for the last couple of years. Yeah, I remember when the, I think the first pre-cons came out in 2011, 2012, around, around that around time. time I think. Yeah, that was when I, uh, my first pre-con, the thing that got me into Commander, it was the Kalia deck. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that. The earlier pre cons were so good. Especially the ones that you could buy that people were buying out because it had a Teferi's protection in it, just because it was cheaper to buy a pre con than to buy the cards. Oh, yeah, like last year. Yeah, last year. I honestly did not know that Edgar Markov could have a Teferi's protection in the pre con. Like, that's kind of insane. It's crazy to think about it. It really is. Um, I remember the old precons used to have lightning greaves in them. Like, holy yeah. cow! And now they all come with soul rings and command towers to get it into it. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely the best way to start, though. So. And it's a good I mean, way also, to get you into also, it because it gives you the foundations to move on with it. There's also brawl decks, which is not a bad start if you think about it. Like, some of the brawl cards are really good for commander. Right. Right. So we have a lot of, of decks ourselves, uh, well, however many that we could actually uh, afford, some themes and, and personal decks that we own. Uh, Adrian, what is your, probably your favorite and most powerful uh, personal deck that you have that you play a lot? Um, My favorite deck would have to be my artifact deck. It, run, it has partner commanders with... Uh, Bile Smasher the Fears and Silas Wren. I forgot. I think S Sleeper Adept or something. I totally forgot the name. <laughs> I just know him as Silas Wren. But yeah, it's an artifact. I guess you could say Aristocrats because the theme of the deck is artifacts, but I also want artifacts dying or going to the graveyard. And that's how I get a lot of value. And with uh, Silas Wren, when he deals combat damage to a player, I get to cast an artifact card from my graveyard so I can always recur artifact. And I made it, it's a really, it's a, it can be a fast paced deck, but that's on a good hand, really. Um, my I guess my most powerful deck, though, would have to be my Jota deck. It used, I, I used to be, it used to be so powerful that I, tuned it down. It used to have a Flash Hulk combo, which I found it was just kind of boring always trying to win with Flash Hulk. So I just took it out. So now it's this uh, cast big things for five mana deck, really. But it's still pretty powerful and really fun to run as. 
I know my most powerful deck that I like to play uh, a lot. It gets a lot of, of, of hate on the board because it's one of the most like hated commanders. But it's uh, Narset Enlightened Master. And anyone Ooh. who's played against this deck knows that if you see it ever hit the battlefield and if it ever gets at least one trigger, that it's not going to be good for you at all. And you may have just lost the game because with Narset, it allows you to reveal cards off the top of your library four of them and then play them without paying their mana cost which means so many extra turns that eventually your opponents just concede and it's so hard to get rid of because it has hex proof you really have that one chance and one shot of just countering it and that's it and it is high costing but i i built it with a really good mana base and mana rocks so that i can get it out in really early turns so that people don't have as much time to deal with it and it's it's honestly one of my favorite decks um even though it can occasionally get boring because of how fast that it wins i just i, <laughs> I still love it because uh, of what it can do um, um my other favorite commander would probably be uh my tasa karlov deck which i uh i built up uh pretty well with a lot of uh token features because there's just so many death triggers in it and uh, so many ways to sack other creatures. I, I, I love being able to get Yeheni up to such a level uh, because of how many creatures have died with double triggers and then being able to sack so many things to Ashnod's altar for mana. And then there's just so many options for this deck to win. I, I've tormented Hailfire so, for so <laughs> much mana. And it's it's really crazy about what this deck has been able to do in the in the time that I've built it. Um, so, out of your two decks, what do you think are your favorite cards? Um. Well, out of Narset, I gotta mm -hmm. say I really like being able to play play Expropriate, ex <laughs> especially just with uh, the amount of people I that I play with, because the more people, the more people I get to ask time or money, and it's <laughs> it's honestly a great feature. All the other uh, take an extra turn spells that I have in my deck and uh, also uh, the ones with Storm so that I can just take even more turns, which are great also. And the one card that wins the, the, the games for me probably the most is a, a Approach of the Second Sun, which yeah. <laughs> I can easily cast twice when I have like six turns on the stack, which is just, it's really great. And then in Tesa, I even with added cards because I continuously work on them. I uh, I really like the my Razaketh the Foul Blood because it allows me to yeah, tear so Razaketh. many cards. And it, it, it allows me to really get my board state where I want. Um, Revel in Riches because I can get so many more artifacts with the triggers of Tesa. And uh, yeah, I mean, well, they're I all think, pretty great. I, the whole deck think, is built really uh, well. Isn't Revel and Riches that triggers on the opponent deaths, right? I'm trying to remember, but that's still triggers. Revel and Riches, I'm pretty sure, triggers at any point when a creature I think... dies. I create a treasure token, and because yeah, of the taste, yeah. it would create two. And then if I have ten at the beginning of my upkeep, I would win, which is pretty crazy. That and with Smothering Tithe. <laughs> <laughs> right, I I also really love Smothering Tithe. It's it's a great card, and hey, I got, the way, I got that too? one from a pack. Actually, <laughs> I didn't even have to go and buy. I just got lucky in a Ravnica Allegiance pack, and I got it, and I was happy about that. Did you pay the two? I did not pay the two. <laughs> it's such a no one it's ever such a paid high cost two. to pay the two. It is. I've had games no that I played with people where they have just said to me as soon as it hits the battlefield that they're never going to pay for it, and I shouldn't mm -hmm. ask them. But I still ask yeah. them anyway because it's what I do. It's like Ristic Study, you know, in that in that regard. Uh, so let's let's talk about our friends that we uh, play with in our play group who have some pretty good commanders. Also, uh, um, I'll talk about the first one. Uh, we have a friend. We'll go by the first initials of their name. Um, his name his he'll be A. He plays a Omneth Landfall deck. It was his very first commander deck, and I was actually very surprised by how it ran. It was really fun, because Landfall is just a really fun theme in general. You play a land, you get so much value out of it. And running Omnath, you get 
a beefy what was it five five creature you get a a five five red and green elemental creature token on the battle yeah like that's really good and when they die you get to lightning bolt someone <laughs> yeah it's it's a really i mean good, like it's a it's a relatively high costing it's it's up there at, at um yeah at like seven three generics converted mana cost yeah three generics two reds two green but you're running green so lands will right. never so, be a problem yeah, you, for you, you never really have that that mana issue because you can always cultivate or you can go down this reach and get that mana out on the battlefield and, and get your omnath out there and uh I, I believe he runs the other omnaths as well in the deck and if he does, I think he so. I don't think, should. yeah, yeah, I think sadly the, he can't run the newer Omnath because there's no, blue in he it. can't <laughs> do that one, but he can um, do the older ones, the, the mono uh, green one. He can, and yeah, Omnath is just such a fun commander, it is. You don't see it played a lot because I think of its high converted mana cost, but it doesn't take away that from and, what it can do. That, and in a way, I guess it, it's seven, it's still like you know slower is if you're because i think most decks their most commander costs they're mostly at like you're mostly going to go against like threes and fours i think right so they so could you get, can't get it out as quick as, as as some people but um you really are playing a longer game with it anyway because you're building up the mana and and the and the things and, and enchantments that you need to create more of these elementals so that you can kill your opponent and i think that that's kind of setting the the board state so that you can bring Omnath out. He's not one of these ones where you need him out early on so that you can build up your deck. It's you build up your deck first and then you get Omnath out. And with Omnath, you can just build like your elemental tokens up really quick because every land triggers it. And when you have such a when you have such a big army of elementals, people really have to think like if they board wipe that's a lightning bolt for each elemental that's dying so they right. have to think like it can has, this kill me can this that, not it kind of has that tasa ability to it where it it lives for a board wipe because it knows if you do that it's going to adversely affect you yeah Unless... our other friend Oh wait, you want to say something? No, I was just going to point out, unless that the board wipe is some sort of of, of cyclonic rift bounce or like an exile. Yeah. In that, in that case, then then <laughs> that's it doesn't rough. really help. Then it is kind of that's rough. very rough. <laughs> Our other friend will he'll go by R. He runs uh, Shroom the Hegemon. Shroom the Hegemon is a three generic white blue black legendary artifact creature Sphinx. It has flying. It's a five five. When it enters a battlefield, you may return target artifact card from your graveyard to play. He now runs an artifact deck, obviously. Is is an, an is an, it's a crazy ability because you it can is. have any really good card in your graveyard for whatever reason, and you can get it out onto play and, and anything artifact related. So we can talk like Michaelson. No, I remember. Or just anything. It doesn't matter the size, and that's what's that's what's really good about this. I remember um, when I was going against him, he would always, uh, he would use, um, what's the card called? Oblivion Stone, the board wipe. And oh, he'd blow up the board, yeah. cast Sharoom, and he'd just get Oblivion Stone back out. It, it was so annoying. He it was really frustrating to go could, again. He could also Neven Rules Disc as well, which would. Yeah, he can just keep effect. getting recurring his board wipes every single time it's a, it, it was a really it, powerful it, deck it still is it is and he'd had ways to give his permanence uh indestructible like soul of neuphorexia because soul of neuphorexia it's really good because you can activate its ability even in the graveyard and you just pay five and it gives all your permanence indestructible like that's perfect for uh it does have some deck. fallbacks though because it's not on cast it's when it has to come into play so it is yeah. susceptible to counters but and it, it's kind of expensive because it, it's, it's about does the same up. it's about the same price as narset because it's, it's still it's, it's three other colors and then and then three colorless mana so yeah. it, it can it, it can be expensive especially with commander tax but if you if you kind of keep that available because you are running blue so you can also run counters yourself 
it uh, <laughs> even if it hits the battlefield once then it can be it can make so much of a difference because you could get so much back if you're running which you'd be running an artifact deck so the things that you could do is just great with that um our other friend well golem x he plays a riku of two reflections deck and riku he's a two generic blue red green legendary creature human wizard whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell you may pay a blue and a red if you do copy that spell you may choose new targets for the copy and then his other ability, whenever another non-token creature enters a battlefield under your control, you may pay green and blue. If you do, put a token that's a copy of that creature onto the battlefield. That's a really powerful commander. Because this especially has so many... Anything that he does, basically, with this deck, because it's totally copy It's double based. value. It's yeah, Exactly, it's double value. He can copy most things on the board. And I remember... Uh, of some games where he has made copies of everything and then the person who originally had it doesn't get the copy anymore and <laughs> and having everyone have not just you but having everyone have a copy of something can just be crazy as to what that means for everybody depending on the card and he can just keep creating these copies of things it's a very yeah, interesting deck style what's so good about riku it's because as long as he's out on the field you in a way you'll always have like you know like a, a twin cast in hand or like a reverberate something that have, copies always your gonna spell. have something that can copy as a spell anything that yeah has. it's like well, if you, your even spell if gets just, countered just copy it <laughs> even like, if it's just a enchantment that you have on the board that also does that like he'll always be able to copy pretty much anything that hits the battlefield and that's what's really scary so anything that you have in your deck he essentially also has in his deck which yeah, I remember is really overpowered. I remember when we were, um, I was playing against him with my artifact deck, and not to brag, but I got a turn four Blightsteel Colossus. Oh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's, and um, that was probably there. That was probably really uh, upsetting. <laughs> I hate that. So. No, no, he casted. Uh, I think it was Dex Duplicate. When it enters the battlefield, you get to copy a creature and opponent controls. It has dethrone and haste. So he copied my Blightsteel Colossus and made a copy of it with Riku and he took me out. It it was it's insane. Like he can literally win from out of nowhere and it's a, an amazing deck to play. Yeah, he can I, I know, 'cause you and you never know what he's going to copy because you don't know what has a bigger board state. So that you, you really don't know what he's gonna do and that's what's kind of scary about it. Yeah, sometimes I honestly get jealous. I wish I ran Riku because in our play group, we have a rule where, like, when someone has a commander, like, no one in the play group can play it. It, it makes it more like unique. Kind of a broken rule. The the more that um, we create our yeah. more decks, the less that people can create it. But because well, it makes our play group unique. I think though, because there's always going to be something different. So I think it's very nice. Right, you're never going to know what um the deck's going to be just by looking at the commander, because you can always be able to tell uh the deck type. Uh, and then our, we have one more person, actually. Yes, this one, we'll call him uh, N. Mr. He, N. Mr. N. Uh, <laughs> Professor N, whatever we would yeah, like to Miss, call him. Mr. N was our school teacher, actually. And yeah. our surprisingly, he played Magic. Club Magic. That yeah. uh, he basically he headed that. And uh, he, he actually ran some pretty powerful uh, cards as well. He ran a Child of Alara deck. Which anyone who's played oh. against those knows that nothing on the board is ever safe for more than like two turns. So <laughs> that's, I mean, it's and, impossible and it's, it's to make progress. Color, which is just yeah, you can never assemble a board state. It's almost impossible to assemble a board state, at least one that matters. And it's just it's <laughs> really annoying. I remember going against him with my Talia deck, and I just couldn't put him away for some reason. I just couldn't get any dragons demons or angels in my hand and i lost because of travel of, of alara yeah, you really sad. need like just indestructible types of protection like if you have a an angel of hope <laughs> right it, you you really need just the protection from this you make sure that it doesn't hit the board 
or you just, or you just, basically you just don't make sure sure that it doesn't you, you try to make sure that it stays in the command zone because even though it hits the board if you want to keep it alive at all costs because when it goes into the graveyard it's never going to be good especially all the <laughs> things that he can do besides that with the way that the deck is built up it's just never good and, it, and yes it does cost five colors but and he, Child of Lar does have to go in the graveyard, so you got to have a way to get him out of the graveyard into the command zone or back to your hand. True, true, which is uh, is a good thing. But by doing yeah. that, also, he's he's avoiding the commander tax because it has to go into the graveyard. So there's obviously yeah, ways in the deck yeah. to get it back, whether it's regenerate or something, reanimate to get it back onto the battlefield, which either way is just, it's not, it's not, it's not good. He's So he's probably killing this thing uh multiple times in multiple turns <laughs> making it so you just cannot assemble the board state there's multiple trials of alara <laughs> just keeps... <laughs> i wouldn't be surprised i would not be surprised at all um oh i noticed we we kind of jumped over this topic but did we talk about what got us into commander yeah well we we, we started we to did talk how long about that we we how talked about we... how long yeah but um what basically got uh, me into Commander was uh, I was one of those people who, when they were younger, obviously played some sort of card game, whether it was Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh, and I and I was really into those uh, w ways of because it, it was different from board games, but it was different from regular like playing cards, and I really liked the way that it kind of created this realm of being able to do something just with these cards, and it's something that's Hold different on. every time um may i interrupt yeah go ahead let's be honest with ourselves who really played pokemon we we just collected cards because yeah they were no cool. that was, that was <laughs> no one really knew how, how to play pokemon, pokemon. <laughs> now if we're talking like pokemon like video games that you was different saw a shiny those charizard games. like oh i want it <laughs> i'd only really collect those cards i would never play yeah them. i played Yu Gi Oh. i played Yu Gi Oh. oh Yu Gi Oh. oh yeah but it was something that about that of i i believe it was you actually you and uh are who, Yu-Gi-Oh! Who would uh, who who said that I should get into Magic because you you were playing it when I was still playing Yu-Gi-Oh! and you said it was mm -hmm. like a, basically an advanced version of it because so we went, all pretty much ditched Yu-Gi-Oh! for Magic. Well, it's you kind of you grow up, you know. It's it, what you did yeah. as a kid, and you evolve, you know. You Yu go from being able to do this not to something else. I was like, Yu-Gi-Oh is for adults. No. So I g Magic essentially, I grew up from Yu-Gi-Oh into Magic the Gathering, and I went out and bought a, it was a simple, like, construction, a constructed deck of uh, n the Nephilia Moondrakes from Shadows Over Indistrad. It didn't even have that good of cards, but honestly, it was, it was the start of something, of me being able to learn how to play this game, because it was so much more advanced than Yu-Gi-Oh was. And it was a, it was definitely a learning curve for me to get into it, but eventually I did, and then I started to buy like uh, twin planeswalker decks, and then from there I started uh, pre-constructing decks using like magic singles, and then I got into commander, and and then here we are. So, uh, well, how did you get into uh, magic and commander? Um, when I was little, I found a shoebox filled with magic cards and. That's yeah, I know. It was the way you know, just going. Yeah, the, the, shoe, What's the magic shoe magic box. Cards? Yeah, and they were all my dad's, and I thought like, wow, the art on these are so cool. So I just looked it up more, and I found what, out like what, uh, more cards with was really this, cool art. Would you say that these cards were from, like, uh, what set? Okay, my are dad we talking started beta and alpha because uh... I don't know, but my dad started playing like when magic like was this like at like the beginning steps or stages i remember i think the first card i saw was an ancient tomb like the old version oh, the old i don't yeah. know yeah yeah and then so i looked up more cards and i found out like it was an actual card game and i've always been interested in card game because of the of our Yu Gi Oh history right but you know this, and this was different because the the setting of magic like the multiverse meant anything yeah. was basically possible zach, any game zach here he different. he loves the, the multiverse kind of things 
Oh yeah, I love the multiverse. Like I remember when I told you about it, you were like, "There's a multiverse." You should have just told me that. I would have gotten into it. <laughs> I I remember that. That was it was you were talking about a dragon deck that you had of some kind that was I believe it was a standard deck. It was before command. Yeah, it was um it was from when they used to have dual decks. It was knight versus right, dragons. Right. That was like my first magic. Because I got a couple of dual decks myself from older uh, uh types. There was like a. Nisa and an Obnix list. Uh, that was one of the main like dual planeswalker decks. That, oh that, yeah, that, I remember that. I that. Yeah. But I didn't realize that because I when I first bought the Shadows of Our Industrad one and I was like reading the uh story uh arc that came the with lore? It about yeah, the lore that came with uh it was talking about Jace and I didn't realize that he was a planeswalker and what that meant when I realized that I was like the possibilities are basically endless i mean you're telling me that they're hopping pl different planes of existence to different like universes so that there's this huge multiverse of what can happen like that's so much different than Yu-Gi-Oh because it's it, it's endless of what you could do it's in Yu-Gi-Oh, we had an anime we <laughs> right i know that's Although why i wanted the opening to be the series to come out really on, good, on netflix like when that comes out it's going to be great if it ever comes out, it's honestly it's it has the potential to get so many more people into magic, because think about how many people got into Yu Gi Oh because of the TV shows. Exactly, and I remember like Yu Gi Oh Five Ds, Yu Gi Oh GX, yeah, uh, r old original Yu Gi Oh. Like it, it got people into playing the game. Five Ds was the synchro summoning. That was what got me into it. It was definitely was... an interesting card style. Yeah, okay, we're, getting, we're getting too much into uh, Yu-Gi-Oh. It's a Yu-Gi-Oh Yu podcast. Is it? Is it a Yu-Gi-Oh podcast? No. Um. Podcast. Another thing that got us into Magic, we also <laughs> played an online game called Wizard One Hundred One, and that was also a card game. That was is. also a spell singing card game. So it, it, it just lined up. Game. It, it just aligned with what we we were interested in. I played that before I played Magic, and honestly, it was like the idea of the different worlds and everything that was. Yeah, really, I always kind of, loved the idea that. There's all these different things, and and lore and uh, and legends in the little world right now that we we know of, whether it be ancient history of like mythology or whatever it is, that they're all in. There's different sectors, but the things with like Wizard One Hundred One, Magic: The Gathering, and in and, and uh, there was a part from Yu-Gi-Oh, is that the, all of these different options, you know, that it wasn't just stuck in this one area. It's that oh. Well, it, not just this one thing exists, but all these multiple things exist as well. And that's what the really cool thing about magic was. It's like, oh, well, there's this one realm where these humans live, but there's also another realm where elves live and then vampires, and it was basically endless. So all and of the, the Eldrazi. So all of these creatures, <laughs> and yeah, the Eldrazi's even, they make their own creatures. And so that's why it's endless. Like, we haven't hopped every plane. We haven't gone to every universe. That's why... They keep coming out with all these new sets because they'll never. Yeah, like them. right now, I I think this is the first time we're getting an Ikoria set. I'm pretty sure. I think so. That's uh, is is that a new plane? I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a new place or new plane that we haven't gone to. Yeah. What's What's great about Magic is that there's there's so much play style diversity. Like you can you can go from a a storm deck. Uh, an aristocrat's deck, a stack yeah, stack. The, the amount of there's just so many ways and, to play and, it. And if you do tribal and, and just it just going off of the commander, once you have the commander, the amount of deck themes that you can do, whether they're the stronger or, ones or even the weaker ones, it's there's so many different deck styles. It's it's yeah, you can crazy. you can even do like like a jank deck with like a silly combo in it and still find a way to win. There's just so much. There's so many possibilities with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's all these new cards, too, that are coming out in, in all the newer sets, like the Commander 2020 that's coming out, and the Coriolair Behemoth that's coming out that just give you more options, and it'll be like that for however long Magic continues. But that's yeah, and we're still that's for, like, another episode when we talk about... Yeah, and we're um, still in, like, the first quarter of the year. <laughs> right. Like, there's many... There's, like, three or four more sets coming out this I year, I believe. Too. I think we're only in the first quarter of the year, and it's already this bad. We still have Horse Set 20, Zendikar. We're back. We're going back to Zendikar. And I then, swear there better be an Emrakul reprint. Put there's going to be in my animal. I think Emrakul's right still stuck in the moon. She's I, like trapped in the moon. Yeah, according to the story. Yeah, she's like still well, trapped in the moon. If I get an moon. Ulamog or, or Kozilek, I, I, one of the main three, I want to <laughs> reprint. 
what I want. I'm pretty sure they're still stuck in the meditation zone or whatever. In like the giant hedrons. I think they're still stuck in there. Yeah. But um, there's also going to be Commander Legends coming out, like a whole set dedicated to Commander. Like that's insane. All right, so we've covered all the topics and points that we want to get to cover. Um, this is we're going into the end segment of the podcast. Uh, Zach, if you want to say anything, it could be magic related or not. It could be about anything. What do you want to talk about before we end this? I don't know. I just I've been really getting into My Hero Academia lately. Uh, really a lot of storyline with that that's uh really uh, have you seen the most recent episode i have not actually oh you I have don't to want watch it to be it. spoiled for me i'm not i'm, I'm a not, little bit behind but, but I'm, I'm trying to catch up with that please catch up i'm at it's the amazing point of well i don't want to spoil it for anybody else i don't know if they're, if they're not uh, farther in the season is slightly here we'll put it we'll, spoil, the, we'll uh, put a spoiler counter yeah, i'll put a spoiler counter right here um uh, I'm right at the uh, roughly about the point after the uh, provisional licensing exam, where um, they fight the dude who phases through things. Oh, you're on that episode. Yeah. Wow, you're I'm pretty little, far behind. I'm a little behind. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't. Uh, I'm not like I'm still in season one, but I think I'm waiting more or less for the dub to come out. Like, if I have to watch through sub, I will, but I prefer it to be in English. Oh, well, dub, that's going to take a while, though, I think. It shouldn't be. Because usually dub is like, you know, I think they do all episodes before they release it, unless they just do an episode, yeah. then release episode. I'm probably just going to have to uh, deal with it and then... Learn Japanese, man. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's kind of what I did when I was finishing Dragon Ball Super, because uh, and not only was it not in english but like I, I was trying to keep up with when the episodes were coming out and and it, i was just finding them the day uh, of on youtube and before they <laughs> get taken down and sometimes the sub was just for copyright before copyright <laughs> and uh, i was able to finish the series that way it was nice wow all right so that ends the podcast yeah. uh okay i'll think of something okay so uh, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much all we had planned for today. Uh, if you if you like this video, uh, you can like it. You can subscribe to the channel. Uh, oh wait, we do do have our own personal channels. Yeah, we do have our own pre personal channels. I am uh, the Heekster, uh, T H E H E E C K E R. If you look that up, I tend to do some gaming, some 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 singing cover videos, um, relatively all over the place, trying to get that niche found out. Uh, Adrian, I believe you have a channel as well. Yep, it's called it's to reckoning T E H R E C K O N I N G. I mostly do, I mostly do gaming videos with commentary. Um, and both of our Doobie channels warned. will be in the link in the description, so you can go and follow them that way. You be warned though, I am uh, it's not really PG not friendly. safe for <laughs> kids. Yeah. Oh my God, he uses words. What kind of words do you use? They're uh, not. They're not saying bad words. Yeah, very, I can't very stay bad here. words. I'm pretty sure he said bad heck. Words. He said heck one time. Um. Yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys liked <laughs> it, um, then we might continue to do some more of these. We have some ideas for the next episode of doing some things about the new commander set, Ikoria Lyra Behemoths. So, you know, check that out. Uh, we post every Fridays. Try to keep up with that schedule and. Uh, yeah, so everyone have a good day, and this has been uh, Let's oh, wait. Talk Commander Edition. You got one more thing Don't to forget, say? Uh, wash your hands, and uh, stay clean, stay safe. Wa yep, wash your hands, wear a mask, really really, really scrub your hands, don't Get a interact hazmat, with anybody. If you don't have... even play Magic, <laughs> don't, sadly. Don't play as Magic. As much as I hate to say it, don't play Magic. You want to play Magic, but the Gathering's banned. I saw that it, on Instagram. You... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, See everybody in the next episode. Peace.